Welcome to our presentation, Textiles and Chinese Manuscripts. My name is Michelle Wong, and I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Georgetown University. And my co-discussant today is Martin Hedra. He's the Director of the East Asian Library at Princeton University. The focus of our presentation today will be on manuscripts and textiles in the Princeton collections. First, I will present on a Buddhist scroll and its textile wrapper um, from the Silk Road Oasis site of Dunhuang. Next, Martin will present on a Buddhist printed canon as well as other Asian examples. And then finally, we'll offer closing remarks and questions for discussion at the live workshop in May. So I begin by discussing a wrapper which is made out of hemp. And it is roughly square, so uh, 50 by 44.5 centimeters. There are two lines of Chinese text on it, um, one on the wrapper and then one on the tile. And there's also a seal impression. Let me show you a video of Martin unwrapping the scroll. Um, and here you can see very clearly the Chinese text written on the long tie, as well as the Chinese text written diagonally on the surface of the wrapper itself. And also notice some hole and damage mark. You can also see that the um, edges are finished with seams. And here you can see the inscription as well as the seal. In this slide, I'm showing you a map of the Silk Roots and of Dunhuang. Um, so the wrapper and the scroll reportedly came from the Oasis city of Dunhuang. Um, they were purchased at the same time and uh, probably before the 1920s in China and they are part of the guest collection. Although they were purchased at the same time, it's unclear whether they belong together. And um, the city of Dunhuang, as you can see on the map, lies in an oasis at the edge of the Takamakan Desert. It was established in the second century BCE as a garrison town. It was also a major center for trade and religious pilgrimage. Um, and here you can see two views of the Mocha Buddhist caves, um, which are located 25 kilometers southeast of Dunhuang. They comprise a 735 man-made caves carved into um, the eastern side of sandstone cliffs. On the left-hand side, you can see the facade of the caves. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see a view of cave 16 and 17. So we can see into cave 16, and then the gray arrow is pointing to cave 17. Um, this is a smaller cave that was carved um, into the side wall of cave 16. And in the year 1900, more than 60,000 manuscripts, portable paintings, and prints were discovered in cave 17 by the caretaker and Taoist priest Wang Yan Lu. Um, because of this um, cache of items, um, Cave 17 is also popularly known as the Library Cave. The latest dated manuscript discovered from Cave 17, um, dates to 1002, and I'll return to this point later in my part of the presentation. I will be focusing on a Chinese scroll today, um, but please note that languages and scripts in which the manuscripts were written reveal the rich multicultural environment of Dunhuang. In addition to Chinese, there are also manuscripts in Tibetan, Sanskrit, Kotanese, Uyghur, Sogdian, and more. And these represent in their own right different manuscript formats and different interfaces between manuscript and textile. Although at the time of their discovery, sutras had been placed inside wrappers, the manuscripts and textiles were separated, with the result that manuscripts from Jinhuang went to libraries and the textile wrappers went to museums. And here we can see an image on the right a uh, number of scrolls um, now disengaged from the textile wrappers piled up outside of the entrance to Cave 17. The majority of Dunhuang manuscripts uh, were produced in the scroll format. And um, these are sheets of paper that are pasted together in order to form a continuous writing surface. Chinese is written from right to left in vertical columns. And then a round wooden rod is affixed to the end or the left-hand side, which allows the scroll to be rolled up when not in use. And in the left and center image, we can see examples of unopened scrolls from Dunhuang. On the right-hand side, you can see an open scroll from Dunhuang with a wooden rod on the left-hand side or at the end. In the center image, note also the woven silk ties. And these scrolls are not from the Princeton collections, but they represent um, both Buddhist and secular manuscripts. Now let's take a closer look at the Princeton wrapper. And as I mentioned earlier, there are two inscriptions and this reads the 11th bundle. And um, this word, uh, zhi, may be translated 
as either a bundle of scrolls, that is to say number of scrolls would have been placed inside this piece of textile, this piece of fabric, after which it would have been rolled up. Um, this word jur can also be translated as a wrapper, that is the actual um, textile that is wrapped around the scrolls. And the standard assumption is that typically 10 scrolls were placed inside a bundle and then wrapped up inside a textile, such as this item that you see in the slide in front of you. However, this is somewhat problematic because the same word in Chinese, uh, 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 which is translated to English as fascicle, may refer both to a chapter or a section of a text or a physical scroll. According to Buddhist canonical texts and Dunhuang manuscripts, anywhere from between three to 12 fascicles could be placed inside one wrapper or chur. Furthermore, more than one uh, Buddhist text or sutra could be placed inside one wrapper. Therefore, the placement of scrolls into wrappers conform to bibliographic classifications. And given the variations in the length of fascicles, so some fascicles in Buddhist texts are very short, um, other fascicles might be quite a bit longer. In effect, there could be anywhere between 100 to 200 sheets of paper um, pasted side by side in order to produce scrolls inside one bundle or jiu. Um, I also want to point out the enclosures um, in the Princeton wrapper. So in the upper left corner, you can see a loop. In the lower right corner, you can see a, a button, a fabric button, and then in the upper right corner, there's a long tie. And because the inscription, um, which reads the 11th bundle, must have been intended to have been read after the scrolls were wrapped up, um, what I imagine is that the scrolls were placed diagonally um, inside this um, nearly uh, square-shaped um, textile. And I'm imagining that maybe the button was affixed through the loop, um, and then the rest of the fabric was rolled up and then affixed with a long tie. In this photograph from Oral Stein's account of his travels rooms into the cafe, um, cafe we can see a number of bundles of Dunhuang manuscripts. And I want to draw attention to the two, um, well, there's one in the center and the one in the upper right. And this is what I imagine um, the hemp wrapper of the Typhon and Princeton collection would have looked like um, after the scrolls were placed inside and the wrapper was, well, wrapped up and then fastened. Um, we can also see other bundles of manuscripts in which the um, top and bottom ends are exposed. So we can see, for example, um, some of those wooden rods poking through. And these indicate that those scrolls uh, were um, rolled up in a different type of wrapper, and we will also return to this point. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when manuscripts were taken out of Cave 17 and brought to museums and libraries, um, they were disengaged from the wrappers. Um, as a result, not only do manuscripts and wrappers um, exist in different collections, um, but it is also difficult to reconstruct the original arrangement inside um, Mogao Cave 17. Um, for example, which scrolls were found inside which wrappers and where they were placed inside the cave while to do other bundles or items. Um, however, the inscriptions written on some wrappers, which provide the sutra titles, can provide some information in this respect. In this image, we can see the second Chinese inscription, and this is on the long tie, and this gives us the date of the wrapper, and it tells us that respectfully recorded on the date of the third month of the first year of the Treikong rain era, this translates to the year 685, um, that this item was donated by someone named Li, and the personal name is unknown. So this could refer, for example, either to a donation of the wrapper, a donation of the Buddha Sutra, um, the scrolls that were placed inside the wrapper, or perhaps both. So we do see records of donations of sutras, donations of wrappers, as well as donations of sutras and wrappers recorded among the Dinhuang manuscripts. Okay. Now I want to draw attention to the seal on the wrapper, and this red seal was impressed um, just below the last character of the inscription, so under the word zhi, meaning either a wrapper or a bundle. And it translates to English as the seal of the great king of Gua Prefecture and Sha Prefecture. And Gua Prefecture and Sha Prefecture refer to Dunhuang as well as a, um, another a so-called oasis site, um, that is uh, Yilin. And both of these regions um, became independent from Tibetan rule in the mid 9th century. And the title great king is of interest to us because this was used by a number of local rulers 
um, from uh, the ruling clan in Dunhuang during this time, beginning in the 10th century. Um, however, according to the Chinese scholar uh, Wang Yanming, um, the ruler most likely to have used this particular title, that is, Great King of Gua Prefecture and Sha Prefecture simultaneously, is most likely to have been uh, Cao Zongshou, one of the later rulers of the Cao clan. And he reigned between 1002 and 1014. So what this seal tells us then is um, that perhaps in the early 11th century that this wrapper passed through the collection of the Cao clan. Um, but notice, however, that this um, is not the same as the date um, at which um, the wrapper was originally produced. So that date is recorded to us as at 685. In this slide, I'm showing you two comparative examples. These are two wrappers, um, likely hemp, um, um, perhaps linen. So there's a little bit of um, uh, confusion about this. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to examine these in person. Um, also from Jinhuang, um, they do not have dates uh, written on them, unlike the Princeton wrapper. So they've been dated by the Musei May between the 7th to 10th centuries. Note that they are roughly um, equivalent in size to the Princeton wrapper, and they're also uh, roughly square in shape. And the inscriptions on them give us both the title of the sutra, um, as well as the number of the bundle. So on the left, um, the inscription, which interestingly enough is written um, in vertical columns, but from left to right rather than from right to left, indicates that the scrolls that are placed inside are from the 60 Fascal Flower Garland Sutra, and this is the fourth bundle. And on the right, um, the sutras that were placed inside uh, were from the Large Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, and this is the first bundle. Also notice one character located to the right. Um, this may indicate the personal name of the donor, um, uh, Jiang. And um, here we can see also that the fastings are a little bit different from the Princeton wrapper because rather than a button and loop, uh, we can see that there are two ties. Um, so one short tie and one long tie. And I want to go back to the year 1002. And I mentioned that this was the year of the last dated manuscript that was found from Malkal K17, the library cave. And this gives us a record of a donation of wrappers and scrolls um, from the king of Dunhuang, uh, Cao Zongshou, um, into whose possession um, the Princeton wrappers believe to have passed. And it states that the king of Dunhuang and his wife, both devout Buddhist devotees, ordered workmen to make wrappers and write scrolls to be deposited in a local monastery, the Baoan Monastery. And this is recorded as having um, uh, uh, been donated in the year 1002. And we have a number of records of this type of donations of wrappers or donations of textile in order to make sutra wrappers. Um, next, let's turn to the scroll and we'll discuss this briefly. Um, this is also written in Chinese script and it's produced from 10 sheets of paper that were joined. And this particular sutra, um, this, uh, excuse me, uh, the title of which is the Light Emitting Professional Wisdom Sutra um, exists in 20 fascicles. And here we can see the sutra. And one thing that we can talk about further during the live workshop is that the outer title is made of paper. Um, stiff paper does not originally belong to the scroll, but rather the title belongs to a different Buddhist sutra. Um, there's also a seal on the scroll, and it is the same seal that was impressed upon the uh, wrapper. So this might uh, argue that both the wrapper and the scroll belong together um, because they seem to have passed into the possession of the great king uh, Cao Zongshou at around the same time. And uh, one question is whether they belong together. And the scroll itself is undated, um, so it does not have a date clearly written on surface, unlike the wrapper. Although scholars who have studied the scroll at Princeton hypothesized that it very well may date as early as the 7th century based on the calligraphy style. However, since the sutra has only 20 fascicles, uh, which may or may not equate to um, 20 scrolls, um, it doesn't seem feasible that there could have been 11 bundles altogether. So this does raise questions as to whether the scroll and the wrapper originally belong together. Um, and let's turn next to an example of what, how wrappers were represented, um, as well as the scrolls that were put inside them in Dunhuang Art. And what you see is a painting 
This is one of, of roughly a dozen paintings originally named in Tinghuang and now found in collections around the world, in which we can see traveling monks um, carrying sutras um, back to East Asia. And here the monk is wearing a rather complicated looking backpack. And we can note bundles of sutras. And here the tops and bottoms are exposed. And we can see how wrappers would have protected sutras as they were transported over long distances. And the type of wrapper that is represented in this painting is very likely um, one of the types that you see represented here. And these are two examples of wrappers from the British Museum. And I'd like to show more of these during our workshop so we can discuss these further and compare them to the Princeton wrapper. And um, so they are very different because um, they are roughly rectangular in shape. And the height of these wrappers is roughly half that of the hemp wrappers um, from Princeton and the two that I showed you from the Mise Guimé. And they are much closer to the height of scrolls so that they could be wrapped around the scrolls and yet leaving the tops and bottoms exposed as you saw in the painting shown in the previous slide. Um, they're different in construction from the hemp wrappers because they are lined either with paper as you see on the left or with flat bamboo splints as you see on the right. Um, and some of the issues that I like to take up for discussion um, at the live workshop um, is the terminology that's used to describe wrappers. Um, so I've introduced one term, zhi. Um, there's another term called fu that one sees in the modern Chinese scholarship. And to discuss the semantic valences of these terms, um, we can return to the issue of how to translate these terms, uh, zhi or fu, whether it's a wrapper or a bundle of scrolls. And I think we can also um, unpack further um, their dual functions as protecting their contents, um, the Buddha scrolls that were wrapped inside, and as well as their purposes for organizing um, Buddhist scrolls and contributing to bibliographic classifications. So um, we will continue talking about these points. But for now, let me turn things over to Martin. Okay, uh, we are now going, we stay in the Buddhist world, uh, but we are going to a very different period in a very uh, different region. We are going to talk printed works, the Chisha Canon, um, 12th to 16th century. That is a little bit what we're going to talk about. Uh, so what do I call the Chisha Canon? It refers to the huge Buddhist canon made at the Chisha Cloister near Suzhou. So that is the area, uh, the Jiangnan area, the most uh, economically uh, prominent area in, in, in China. And it was also uh, in the period we are talking about, the center of the printing uh, history. Some figures, uh, almost 600 cases, more than 6,000 uh, volumes. Uh, some of them are done later. Uh, and uh, we are talking about huge project, 180,000 uh, pages uh, with probably double-sided blocks. Next, please. The woodwork started to be cut in the 13th century. Uh, this was, this took more than a hundred years. And by the time that it actually, the. Uh, the canon was completed, these 6,000 volumes. Uh, the earlier cut woodblocks were already uh, unavailable for use. There were fires, there were uh, replacements were necessary. A major effort to complete the canon took place under the very famous Buddhist uh, monk Guan Zhuba, a Tibetan. He was also involved with Tengut uh, canon, with Uyghur canon. So also here in this area, Buddhism uh, tends to be a very multilingual and a multicultural uh, area. Um, Guan Zhuba worked in Hangzhou from 1300 to 1310, and we will see that is important for the illustrations in the canon. Uh, now, there were a few other uh, projects going on. Uh, they were, uh, the Puning Canon was better funded, was done way quicker, but they were actually destroyed by a mad monk at the end of the UN. Next slide. So uh, the Chisa Canon therefore for something like close to four centuries remained the canon most easily available to order prints from because in the Chinese case, books are printed upon demand. You go to the place who has the wood blocks and that is where you, uh, with your paper and you pay for uh, a work to be done. Now we have something like 85% of the volumes in oh, on one form or another. So a huge amount of, of silk uh, text are covered because each volume has that. Uh, but um, we, th we are going to talk about what, uh, how, how this all fits together. Uh, 
most of the silk uh, clearly is was a one-time project. Next slide, please. So very important it is to realize that Chinese books, we date them by the cutting of the wood block, uh, not the date of the actual printing, which can be different or, uh, or the same as the date of the paper and can be different or the same as the date of the silk cover. And when you think that is a little bit strange, it's certainly not the Western tradition, we will face the same thing with current ebooks, which are printed on demand. You know, there can be a quite a difference between when they are printed, when the text was actually composed. And for scholars, of course, all these dates are important. And actually, uh, there can be a different story, certainly be, be uh, behind each copy of the canon, the 6,000 volumes. Uh, and you have to figure out which wood blocks were used when and where and how, and uh, well, how one knows, but also how and when were they covered with silk. It is all different, and each single volume can actually have a different story, and we can show them uh, that they are. The Prince Letitia Cannon story has been most uh, recently quite rewritten by Lucille Jia, who took a decade of coming uh, to search these, uh, these things. Next slide, please. So this is how a case looks like. Uh, what I show here is case 156. It is dated to 1238 to uh, a little bit the beginning of the printing um, uh, of the cutting of the wood blocks. We have slightly earlier uh, dated volumes but they don't have a frontispiece. And since illustrations are always nice to show, we normally show this one. Uh, you can see there is here a, a small a label with a character on it. That's the organization. Each case is ordered uh, according to the thousand character classic, which is a, a, a classic, which a, a poem on the origin of the world, which people use to learn um, to learn characters from. So the 156 character in that poem is Yang, which you see here. Uh, those uh, labels actually, of course, are often missing, uh, but we still have a few. And you can see here they were stored horizontally. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see how the volumes inside look, and here we can already see that at least one of these volumes, uh, they normally have 10, I showed here four, actually has the same silk as the outer, so that the case uh, was covered with silk at the same time as at least that fourth volume. Next slide, please. But you can also see that all these volumes were different, and that is, that is a normal uh, practice. And the back is also different from the front. Uh, here we see four of the backs for uh, actually the same volumes we just saw. Next slide, please. The backs are uh, more plain. So we have uh, some, so a lot of our uh, volumes have traditionally been dated and thought to be printed uh, in the Song and the UN, UN period. And, uh, but now the question is, it might be that it's just the wood blocks which date to that, but there are certain volumes which are made up by blocks cut and carved later. Uh, and the latest one dates to the 16th century. And that might be the date of the actual print of the whole set uh, from the original blocks. That's, that's quite a possibility. A further 40%, and we will see that in a moment, are handwritten manuscripts. Those are, uh, a lot of them are dated 1600 to 1602, which by the way, is later than we actually think the woodblocks were still used or still extant. So, and it is on very different paper. Uh, and therefore it will be an open question. Their silk seems to be similar, but the printed volumes are, are, are different. And uh, the paper of the printed uh, uh, and the uh, handwritten volumes are, are different. Next slide, please. And we see that here. So to the right, we see the printed volume. It's yellow. That's probably because of the use of a kind of juice uh, against uh, insects. The white paper is treated with alum. That makes it white. So it is not yellowed because of age. Uh, but, uh, that's but you see here, the same silk is used, but we have here very different paper, 
we think they are actually date from slightly different periods, even if we don't think that the first, uh, that the printed one was actually printed in, in 1238. Uh, it should be printed before the, uh, the handwritten one was done. And so that is a little bit, uh, that remains a question. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the frontispieces, which I just referred to, are very much in the Sino Tibetan or the Tangut style, that is the influence of Guangzhou. And most of those can be very much dated to 1302 or 1306. And we even know, you know, the street on which the printing shop uh, was, uh, was there. The paper is slightly different from the paper of the text, and they were clearly indiscriminately attached to. Uh, to volumes. Uh, there doesn't seem to be too much rhyme or reason why a particular title has a particular uh, illustration. There are something like eight uh, uh, different uh, illustrations. We only have four of them. Uh, there, this accordion style format is called the sutra style. It was by the time uh, that these things were made, whether it's the 13th or the 16th century, it was already not the normal book style. The book style is in a thread bound style. Uh, so that's why uh, you get a kind of um, an idea that this kind of binding belongs to sutra style. Uh, however, in the 16th century, it was expensive. The silk was expensive. This kind of style was expensive. By the 16th century, the, uh, the actually the Shisha canon disappears because it is replaced by another, uh, the Jiaxing canon, which is actually printed in the normal print style with paper covers. Uh, although occasionally it seems that they could have, have silk as well, but I've never seen that. Next style, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a colophon. Colophon gives dates, names of donors, circumstances of printing, uh, and prices. Very important. However, these are not deleted. You know, uh, they don't necessarily refer to the date of printing uh, of the actual volume, and they are even not uh, necessarily deleted when they are recarved. We don't really have recarvings here, but uh, so even the colophon can be recarved and then it's far from the, the date it, 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 was, it, it was made. Next slide, please. Okay, silk uh, studies on the silk are only starting. One major study which uh, studied 2000 volumes uh, thinks that this luxurious silk cover is really a Ming period uh, phenomena, actually a mid Ming uh, period, and is related to the imperial workshops. Well, that is an, uh, a theory which is easily refuted by other Princeton examples because we have, we have other uh, things not dating to the imperial palaces and they have uh, silk. Um, there's a great variety of silk. Uh, of the 2000 volumes, there are a thousand different kinds. And I actually found out that the last few decades, museums are buying these for the, for the history of, of the textiles, not for the text. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, just a uh, kind of couples of, uh, of a common uh, ritual. It still exists. You still can, can see them. Uh, and we know that these come from different uh, temples in, uh, in Jiangnan area, and they all have silk. Next slide, please. They, we can see they are very different kind of audience because the style of the frontispieces, the style of the characters can be very different. And this kind of, uh, of uh, custom you know, continues to the Republican. So this idea of that it is uh, Ming and Imperial doesn't really hold. Next style, please. Same style, different edition, uh, uh, same title, very different style. Next slide, please. Okay, now uh, we do actually have in Princeton also another one. I'm not going to talk much about it, the Jung the Northern Canon. 
uh, where we have half of the uh, almost 7,000 volumes. That is really very large. That was done at the uh, Imperial. Everything screens, you know, luxury at that. That was actually very difficult to get at for normal people because you have to have court relations to be uh, asking for a donation of the whole canon and you would build a whole building for it. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, that is, in our case, rather firmly dated around uh, 1590. It was actually an additional uh, addition to the original woodblocks, uh, 1419, 1440. So here we have a very clear differentiation between when the woodblocks were cut and where, when our copy was printed. Um, and uh, I actually have seen some things online where people don't really pay enough attention for that difference, where I actually think uh, they also are talking about something printed in the, six, in the late 16th century, while they uh, are dated, uh, they date them to the early uh, 15th century. Next slide, please. So we unfortunately do not have uh, time to go in many other Asian traditions, but this kind of the incorporation of silk in Buddhist works is quite prevalent. Uh, in very different ways out of reference uh, of the words of the Buddha. Next slide, please. Just a few examples. This is the one of the 108 volumes of the uh, Mongolian Kanjur. You see here a block and uh, some people refer to this as the, a silk veil. Next slide, please. This is a close up of the Rondo. Uh, next slide, please. And here are you see when that is lifted, when the veil is lifted, you see pictures of the deities and in gold uh, uh, writing uh, the title of the, this particular sutra. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another example. Burmese palm leaves, they are covered by, by, by silk. This is mid 19th century Gujarat silk. Uh, and so that is also a, a quite nice uh, cover. Next slide, please. This is the inside, the palm leaves, different kind of silk. Uh, now there is in English a uh, rather specialized, uh, specialized study about woven binding tapes. Uh, they might have how uh, a bundle like this is, is bound together. They might have uh, titles in there. They might have other things uh, woven inside. We don't have an, uh, unfortunately, we don't have an example, but uh, there is an English book on, on that. Next slide, please. Uh, this, on the other hand, this is cotton, European three color cylinder print, I've been taught. Uh, late 19, early 20th century. And this actually tells us something about the content because we it's a Shang manuscript. We don't know much about it. We don't have specialists like that in Princeton. We bought it for the kind of binding. And here it's actually the textile who tells us a little bit about when that manuscript was made. Next slide, please. So we bought it actually for this. It's a kind of particular binding. It uh, hangs from the top. Uh, this is a little bit my part of the presentation. Michelle, you are going to uh, wrap it up, so to speak. Thanks, Martin. Um, so we'd like to leave you with some closing remarks and questions um, to be taken up at the live workshop. So specifically, how can textiles enrich your understanding of manuscripts and vice versa? How do textiles appear in conjunction with different binding methods, um, which you've seen today? Um, how might textiles be used to protect, organize, and conceal manuscripts or their contents? And what is the significance of text written on the textiles accompanying the manuscripts? Um, Martin and I would like to express our thanks to the textile specialists who assisted us with the research for this presentation. Particularly, we would like to thank Rosemary Krill from the Victoria and Albert Museum, who connected us with all the wonderful scholars um, whom you see um, named on this slide. And we would also like to thank the co-principal investigators of the Book in the Silk Roads Project for inviting us to participate in this workshop. And um, for the assistance, we'd also like to thank Melissa Mortem and Dario Mastroianni. Um, thanks very much. And we look forward to meeting you in May.